Hello everyone, welcome back to Kitchen Table Church. It's been a fantastic week, hasn't it, uh, with the weather? Um, and it's just been wonderful to be able to get out into the garden or to go a walk in the forest and to enjoy the many blessings that God has given us at this time. And I hope you've enjoyed some of the things that we've organised this week. We had our Bible study on Tuesday night and then we started our discipleship group on Thursday night. So if you would be still interested in joining the discipleship group, please let me know because it's very fundamental to what we're going to be speaking about uh, today. And uh, also, like there's plenty of room uh, with the wonders of technology. And also on Friday, Keris helped me put out our first uh, video to speak to our youngest members, Five Alive. And it's great that I've received my uh, first picture back from Elizabeth and thank you Elizabeth for doing so. So that's going along with the picture I received as an, an Easter present. Uh, it's going up in the wall of my study. But please, uh, those challenges that Kara set, the, the keepy ups and, and indeed the colouring in, if you have any pictures you want to send me or sh uh, small videos that you want to send, send them in. And listen, you don't have to do the keepy ups, kids. Uh, get your dads to have a go. There's apparently some dads in both Edenderry and Seskinor that believe they have footballing skills, so or, or big brothers even, or big sisters. Get them to do the keepy ups and we'll see just what is the, the best total and send your videos in to me or, or drop me a text about them and we'll chat with them later on. As usual, I've put some more information in the blurb down below, some more hymns for yourself to listen to and uh, of course some other uh, links to maybe programs or, or that that might be of interest to you in the subject that we're going to be speaking about today. And we're continuing with our study of that church in Colossae, that young church full of, of newly converted Christians and what it has to say to us today and in the challenging times we face at the moment. So as we come to worship God, we come with our call to worship. These are the words of Jesus. And it's really interesting to read these words at this time when so many things that we thought were necessary for life have been removed from us. You know, we, we sometimes live for our holidays, we, we live for our families, or we live to get to the gym, or we live to get to work. And suddenly, because of this pandemic, those things that have given us comfort for so long have been removed for, from us. But the words here from John 17, Jesus' words, they tell us what is eternal life. Father, the hour has come. Jesus said, Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We are going to worship that one true God, the King, as we sing, King of Kings.
That hymn reminds us that Jesus was a gentle saviour and a mighty redeemer, but also the King of Kings. And we're going to pray to God now with a prayer that that King taught us. It's known as the Lord's Prayer or the Family Prayer, but we're going to adapt it a wee bit and, and pray a prayer based on the Lord's Prayer. So please, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you indeed are our Father, adopting us into an eternal family. As an earthly father has compassion on his children, so you show compassion on those that respect you. You know us so well, and you know our weaknesses. Hallowed be your name. You alone are holy. There is none like you. Your glory is above the heavens, yet you bend down to lift up the needy. We praise and worship you because you are indeed holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ your kingdom has already come. Even though rulers on earth gather against you, thinking they can stop your ways and will. But they cannot, for you have made Christ your anointed one, the everlasting, all-powerful King of creation. Give us this day our daily bread. All creatures look to you for what they need at the proper time. When you provide, they are satisfied with all the good things. When you hide your face from them, they are terrified. Lord, help us to be good stewards of the gifts of food you have given us, so that all may have their daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Blessed are those whose sins are forgiven, whose sin is covered, and who know the joy of forgiveness. As we are forgiven, help us to become like Christ, forgiving those who sin against us. Save us from this time of trial and deliver us from evil. In mercy, Lord God, answer the prayers of all those in deep distress. Hear the cries, especially of those who are persecuted because they call you Lord. Hear our cries as we see our world turned upside down by disease. Hear our cries for those that worry about their jobs and how they will provide. Hear our cries for those that worry about their children's education or the pain of being separated from parents. At this time, Lord, save us from ourselves from falling into sin. Let your light shine upon us. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to continue reading the book of Colossians, that letter Paul wrote from his prison cell to this small church in Colossae. And we're going to read the passage we read last week that Nigel read for us, but we're going to read it again as Molly reads God's word. Today's reading is from Colossians 1 verse 1 to 14. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we've heard about your faith in Jesus Christ and the love that you have for all the saints. Your faith and love have arisen from the hope laid up for you in heaven, which you have heard about in the message of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as in the entire world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, so it has been also bearing fruit and growing among you from the first day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. You learned the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow slave, a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also told us of your love and spirit. For this reason, we also, from the, day, from the day we heard about you, have not ceased praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good deed, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the display of all patience and steadfastness. 
joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. We deliver us, he delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of, of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thank you, Molly. As we come to study God's word, we're going to take a moment in prayer to ask God to illuminate his word in our hearts. Let us pray. Lord, prepare our hearts that we might hear your word today and obey your will for your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We agreed last week to be different in a world that wants us all to be the same is a very difficult thing. It was difficult for the Christians living in the first century in Colossae and not much has changed in reality. It still is difficult, maybe more so challenging to live today for Jesus is difficult. As we started to look at this young church in Colossae, made, made up of those that were new to the faith, but living in this challenging and changing world, we saw that Paul, the author of the letter, was excited to be writing to them because he had heard of their faith and love, which had been grounded in the hope of spending an eternity with Christ. So he, was, he wants to encourage them. And the best way to do this, especially for Paul, since he was under arrest in Rome, hundreds of miles from Colossae, was to pray for them. And that is what Paul did. And what we are going to look at today is Paul's prayer. You know, that passage that, uh, from that passage that Molly read to us from verses 9 to 14, that help us understand how and why we should live our lives as disciples and what Christ has done for us. Paul starts by telling us that he's praying. We have not stopped praying for you, he says. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. I seem to have been studying all my life. Seems a strange thing to admit to, but it is true and it is strange because even though I have studied all my life, I am not a natural studier. And I really think I don't really like to study. I started school at a, an early age, four I was, when I first was sent out the door. I left school at 16 not really knowing what I was doing with myself. So I went back to technical college for a year, which confirmed one thing uh, and which I had learned over the previous 12 years. And that was, I didn't like to study. I left the following year and started to work. And then about a year after that, I entered into a career and Strangely enough, it was a career that required me to study and to keep up with changes and, and methods and technology. Continuous development, they called it, or another name that they thought up for it was lifelong learning. And then I felt a call to ministry. So I had to start studying to catch up all the studying that I should have done when I was, you know, a teenager and hadn't done. And then I started to study theology and eventually I entered into Union College and managed to receive a degree. And now I spend a sizable portion of my week in a room in the manse called The Study. Studying. Uh, and today the pursuit of knowledge seems to be paramount. You have to study. You need to be qualified, it seems, to live. This idea, though, of lifelong learning or continual development is exactly the sort of learning that Paul is praying for us in this passage. It's not a quick fix type of learning or just, you know, do six steps and, and you're finished. Paul prays that God will continually, continually fill us with knowledge of his will. Again, this is one of the things we talk about as individuals and as churches. It's something we search for. What is God's will? What is God asking of me? What is God asking of the church that I belong to? This is one of the reasons we have started a discipleship group in the churches, because this is a continuous need to seek God's will, to understand God's will for us in the big Questions like, who should I marry? Or what career should I pursue? You know, where should I live? And also in those small, small decisions, those small everyday decisions, like what I do when that person's rude to me. How do I get on with that person in, in school that refuses to sit beside me? 
what I do when I'm driving and that person cuts me off and I, I, I want to sound the horn and shout something at them. And although it looks like all I'm talking about is getting guidance of how to live each day, which indeed it is, it also happens to be far more than this. You see, how do you know whether you have pleased someone or maybe not pleased them? Is it not because we know that person and we know their likes and dislikes? So we know what we do will either please them or, or not. For those that are closest to us, like our parents, how do we know that our actions will make them proud or disappointed with us? Is it not because of our, from the earliest moments of our lives, we have been learning by the things they do and say that show us they love us and what pleases them? And also by the things that we have been doing and, and saying by our successes, and, and this is important, our failures also, that show their will for us. And we know their will for us because we know and have learned over all those years their character. Our Heavenly Father, you see, is no different. As one theologian wrote, to know God's will is effectively to know God's character. The two always go together in the Bible, which led this, him, this theologian, to this conclusion. To understand what God wants, we need to know him, and we need to know what he is like. To know what God is like, we need to spend time with him. This is a prayer God wants to answer for us all, and in us all. Yes, it is hard to swim against the current. It is hard to be different, to be true to our Christian faith. But if we don't know God, if we don't take time to get to know him, how will we be able to live lives that please him? How will we be strengthened to have that endurance, that perseverance, that patience when it comes to a time of trial? When it comes to a day like today? As some of you know, one of my great passions is Liverpool Football Club. I can talk about this with ease as I think I'll not get too much stick at the door, which I might get on a normal day. Anyway, I started to support Liverpool in the 1960s, and that was before they started to win all the trophies. They had returned to the First Division in 1962, and I, was, I think as a child I started to support them about 1969 or 1970. And of course, it has been great to see them lately become the greatest team in the world. Well, they are world champions at least. Much of the praise for the team's very recent achievements has gone to their manager, Jurgen Klopp. And he's just such a, a character. In fact, it might be said it is all down to his knowledge, his ability to communicate with the players and to get the best out of them and to get them playing together. It's all down to that ability as a manager and a coach. In the footballing world, the current great players are queuing, so I'm told, up to move to, to Liverpool because of Klopp. But Klopp has replete, repeatedly discarded the famous names and tech, taken lesser known players and then trained them to play his way. It is through Klopp's skill that the players become qualified to play for the team. But even before Klopp can work with a new player, there is a number of qualifying factors. The transfer fee, the contract and the medical to make sure they don't have two left feet. And when all of this has been met and agreed, there is the period of thanks and celebration as the new player is unfurled to the fans. There, is, there are some things that I will never be qualified to do. I will never be a surgeon or an astronaut, nor will I ever run out for Liverpool. And as I know these things are reality, so some people wonder at the reality of what qualification is meant to get them into the kingdom of light as one of God's holy people? Do I have to improve like one of Klopp's players? Do I have to reach a certain standard of holiness? Do I have a basic exam to pass or attend some course? Many believe that Christianity is only for good people, that there are those that need not apply. 
I'm not good enough for church or I only go to church because I know it pleases others that I do. But I can't be good like those Christians. There is much, friends, that is wrong with this type of thinking. Firstly, Jesus never taught this. He spent time with everyone. Jesus had time for everyone. Jesus spent time with sinners, with the hated tax collectors and the prostitutes and people who, who thought they weren't good enough. The only people to complain at his actions were actually the religious types who clearly thought far too much of themselves. And secondly, how do we measure being qualified for the kingdom of light? What pass mark would that be in a theology exam? Or if it was a sporting test, how fast would you have to run or how high would you have to jump? And what happens if you miss, even with your best efforts, what happens if you miss the pass mark by a single mark or the smallest fraction of a second or you don't clear, clear that bar by a millimetre? You see, this is the wonderful thing about the gospel of Jesus. It is not about what we have done to qualify us nor about what we can do. It's all about what he, Jesus, has done. Look at verse 12. The Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That is why Paul is thankful and that is why we get to get together around our tables and in our living rooms and hopefully soon back in our churches because God has qualified us. The qualification is a gift. God gives us the status of being his holy people. As Paul writes to the Roman church, all are justified, all are qualified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Qualified by grace alone, through Christ's death alone, and by faith alone. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, the kingdom of light, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. But just imagine for a moment, friends, if you were signed by Liverpool or some team you dreamed of joining and you thought, great, I have made it. And because you thought you were in, you didn't turn up for training. What would happen? The coach couldn't work with you. Your coach and teammates wouldn't know you. And eventually, as we often see in football, another team would come and take you away because you would grow restless and dissatisfied. That's what the coach of the team of darkness wants for you. He's called Satan. And he doesn't want you to transfer from his team, the team of darkness, to the team of light. And if you do, he's going to work at unsettling you to lead you astray. And for many in the church, that is the reality. They don't turn up. Even though God has paid the transfer fee to rescue them from the team of darkness and bring them on to the team of light, it didn't matter how much the asking price was. God paid it in full through his son Jesus. It didn't matter what the personal terms were because you are to share in the, in the full inheritance of a son of God. You are to become a family member and it didn't matter that you had two left feet. God qualified you to play for his team and then you just don't show up. You get there, but you don't show up. You see, to be different in a world that wants us all to be the same is a difficult thing. It costs to be a disciple. It was difficult for the Christians living in first century Colossae and not much has changed. It still is, if not more so. It is costly and challenging to live today for Jesus. How do we avoid this? Well, in footballing terms, we avoid this by turning up to train and to listen to the coach in order that we find our place in the team. And in our discipleship, we need to remember Paul's prayer that asks God to continually fill us with knowledge. And for that to be realised, we need to embark on that lifelong learning, a continuous learning that we spoke of earlier so that we can find our place in God's kingdom, so that we can know him as our saviour and coach and know his good and pleasing will for us, so that we can endure and be patient, so that we can live life to the full. As Paul puts it, a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. 
Amen. We're going to take time now in prayer to respond to what we have just heard. And we're going to use Paul's prayer as our basis for what we are going to pray. And then we're going to sing a really beautiful new hymn, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Some of you may know it. I did put it on the Facebook page um, just to highlight it. But it has wonderful words. But it highlights what we're studying here in Colossians, that we're qualified to enter into God's kingdom, not by anything we do, but by Christ's work on the cross. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come and we ask that you would continually fill us, fill our family, our loved ones, fill our neighbours and our friends with the knowledge of your will, that we may develop a wisdom and understanding through the work of the Holy Spirit, that we may live lives worthy of the Lord Jesus, and that we may please you in every way, bearing good fruit as we serve those around us, as we serve you, and as we grow in the knowledge of your goodness and compassion, dear Lord. We want to be strengthened, Lord, with all the power according to your glory, so that we may have great endurance and patience and perseverance to live lives worthy of your calling. Lord, we are so thankful indeed that it is through your Son, Jesus, we are qualified to enter into the kingdom of light, into his kingdom, that we have been taken from the powers of darkness into the light, into the truth of your great love. Father God, we thank you that through this great love, this great compassion, we have been redeemed and our sins are forgiven once and for all. Never to be dredged up, moved away from us as far as the east is from the west. Father God, we thank you for what you have done for us. May we remember you in all that we do each day, that we live lives worthy of your great sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me I hope you enjoyed that hymn and it's one that I would hope as churches we would learn and sing with real joy and passion when we return to our buildings. And can I just thank Rachel for all her hard work in putting that together and for those that took part and sang to Catherine, to Hannah, to Karis and to Caroline and anyone else that I maybe have missed there. And thank you to all those that have taken part in, in Kitchen Table Church, not just this week, but over the weeks. And I hope many will volunteer to get involved over the coming weeks. Please persevere with this lockdown so that we can look after one another. Please pray for our neighbours, our medical teams and our essential workers. Let's not grow complacent in our discipleship. There are those that are suffering and in need of our prayers, but if they need practical help, practical help, remember there are people within our churches that are willing to help anyone, whether they're a member of our church or not. So please share that with your neighbours and your friends. And can I encourage you to ask for help if you need it? I'm at the end of the phone. Talk to one another by phone. Look after yourselves physically, mentally and spiritually. Please take care of one another and of yourself. And now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord throughout all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Take care everyone. Goodbye.